Hello, and thanks for joining me today. Today, we're going to dive into, I don't know, one of the most important topics you could ever know, which is really how to learn investing, how to control your financial future. And with us to have this discussion is Susan Laubach. Now, Susan is the author of the book, Rumpelstiltskin's Rules for Making Your Farthings Grow. And she's an expert in personal finance and investing. Now, she worked in the investment business as a stockbroker, a branch office manager, and broker trainer for 15 years and has taught many levels of investment education to both adults and young people as well. Now, Susan's book, The Whole Kit and Caboodle, A Painless Journey to Investing Enlightenment, uh, in 1996 released, was recommended by Economics America and called the most well-rounded source of basic stock information and education by Better Investing Magazine. Susan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Ty. Yeah, I'm really glad that you could be here. So let me start with something that I think a lot of people don't, don't, don't know. Um, stocks and bonds, how are they different? Oh, well, uh, I, can, I, I clarify that actually in one of my rules. Uh, in one, you are a loaner. When you buy a bond, you are loaning money to a corporation or a government agency or the government itself. Um, and when you buy stocks, you are an owner. You are an owner of a business and you need to get that in your head because many people just think it's, I don't know, like pieces of paper or something that goes back and forth, but no, you have a responsibility when you are an, are an owner. And uh, that's why it's a good idea to know what the company you own is doing. Makes a lot of sense. I love it when you put it in that format. As a matter of fact, your book really simplifies a lot of things that a lot of us just don't know. So tell me a little bit more. Rumpelstiltskin's Rules for Making Your Farthings Grow. Very interesting title. So like, what made you come up with this? Well, what is this about? Well, I don't know. You know, the title just sort of flew into my head because um, I based the, the uh, seven rules, so-called rules, uh, on uh, fairy tales, which I thought told the story or uh, told the concept uh, easily. And it was my intention to make the stories uh, humorous enough so that people would read them and be able to then take on some of those concepts that I mentioned that I feel everybody should know as they approach investing. Uh, if you are already an investor, but you have some lack of confidence here and there, um, it also is a good review of what you may already know or may have been um, ignoring, uh, like the big question, how many people have thought to ask, what can go wrong? You know, everybody gets excited about what can go right when they buy a stock, but rarely think about what can go wrong. And Especially, well, you know, we've had a very bad market the last few weeks. So we're in a lore, more of a kind of depressed mood when it comes to investing. But prior to that, people were just buying, 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 and paying no attention to the high price earnings ratios, uh, meaning the high price of the stock relative to what the company was actually earning. And there was, um, you know, a bit of a euphoria going on there. Uh, just crying out for, um, if not a crash, at least uh, putting some realism back into the market. Uh, but nowadays, I think people would be more inclined to ask what can go wrong. But that is one of the things that I felt was important when I was thinking to myself, well, of all the people I've taught, I've taught many, 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 many people over the years. Uh, what is it that I would like them to know, uh, to feel as if they have the armor, they have the ammunition uh, to either go to their broker, their advisor, or themselves, and see to it that they understand each one of these concepts. Hmm. I love that. And you break it down into seven rules. Tell me a little bit more about these seven rules. Okay, I start out actually uh, not with a rule, but actually, but with um, the introduction of how a company goes public, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding that you can invest in anything, and you can't. It has to be a publicly traded company, meaning that it 
has to be either listed on the over the counter. I won't get into the weeds there, but over the counter market or one of the major stock exchanges uh, in the main. There are other ways, but that's in the main. Uh, so one must know or understand how a company goes public and what place the venture capitalist, what, what part the venture capitalist plays in that effort. Uh, once they understand that in the story of Goldilocks and the three bears, uh, she actually gets the three bears to start a chain of inns based on their just right cottage. And then she masters their going public. Um, and then we move right into the earliest mm, thing, or rather I should say the very first things that you should know. And the first rule is based on the rabbit and the hare, I mean the, uh, the turtle and the hare, slow but steady wins the race. In other words, get started and keep going. How many people do you know who have or had money in the bank sitting there and they have said, well, I don't want to, no, I'm not sure I want to get into the market now. No, it's either too high. No, it's too low. No, I'm afraid. No, no, no. Get started and keep going. Anytime, whether it's high, low, or in between, get started and keep going because that's the way to get rich, Ty. <laughs> it's the only way I know of to get rich is by investing not in the bond market, in the stock market, and grow, grow. Uh, so that's rule number one. Rule number so two. So on that rule number one, if you don't mind me asking, how, how does somebody get started? I mean, what if somebody is afraid, doesn't know where to get going? There's so much misinformation. There's so many people with different views and perceptions yeah. and use a financial person yeah. and don't use one. I mean, it's like, ah, maybe that overwhelm is why people don't get started so what do you recommend? Oh, for right. You are absolutely right. And the internet has, has a lot of information and no knowledge. Uh, it, and it's, it's so much more difficult now to, as you said, know where to start. Um, start with this. But once you have read that, and once you have become comfortable with that, then my suggestion is E T. Fs. ETFs are baskets of securities in an industry or an area in which you yourself may have a deep and abiding interest. Now, tell me this, maybe think about your 12-year-old kid or your friends or yourself. What area of this whole nation, this whole economic uh, thing we have that we can invest in. What area interests you, or do you think is kind of exciting? I like or, tech. I'm a I'm a software guy, so I, I like I like tech. Easy choice. Then go to an ETF, which has a basket of securities of companies that are spread across the uh, landscape, and you can take part in each one of those by buying an ETF, exchange traded fund. And you can buy as little or as much as you want. My suggestion, if you are, or your 12 year old kid is a brand new investor and doesn't want to, you know, just leap in, but wants to creep in, then buy just a very little bit of an ETF and watch it, watch it for a while, see what happens to it. Another thing to do it, when you're talking with a young person uh, who knows nothing, um, say, what products do you use? Now you use high tech, you use technology. Um, so that might very well also be the answer of a young person. Well, you know, I, I have my iPhone, I have my iPad, I have a blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, let's look at Apple. Or, and please believe me, I'm not recommending anything other than the concept of the ETFs, because first of all, as you know, it's against the law for me to do that. <laughs> I can't do that in this particular kind of setting. Uh, but I would say, take a look at those products that this person uses so that, especially if you're talking to a young person who is new at this, 
that way they can really feel ownership and they can say, well, I'm going to buy more of that product because I use it myself and I know it's good. So that's a good way to get started. Does that answer your question or is that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I appreciate you spending some time on that step because that's where I think a lot of people do get stuck. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, it's, it's, it's very easy to get all tangled up in all of the things that are coming your way and to, it's hard to keep your focus. So the third thing is knowing the difference between a stock and a bond. And uh, as, as we talked about earlier, a bond is when you loan money and you collect the interest. It's not going to grow any more in value than what you put into it, but you are collecting interest until the bond comes due. Uh, that's something that you buy when you absolutely have to have that money at a certain time in the future to pay for college or a house or retirement or whatever. You got to have that money or to pay someone back. <laughs> so that's a bond. A stock, once again, is ownership in a company. And so knowing the difference and knowing when and where to use both of those things is important, covered in the book as well. Uh, the other, another rule, the next rule, is to understand how a company earns its money. Uh, it may not be in the flashy product that you see. And in fact, the flashy product you see may be losing the company money. And they earn it in some you know, low-tech, backstairs kind of way. Uh, but know the company, I mean, if you're in if you're investing in an individual company, it's very easy and also, may I add, extremely interesting to read about that company in a research, uh, research service called Value Line. Now, most every public library has a subscription to Value Line in their business books, business department looking up the company that you are interested in owning or already own, it'll tell you everything you want to know about it. Or you can Google the company and find out plenty of what you want to know about it on online. But uh, understand how it's actually making its money. And yeah, and that's interesting you say that because if you look at Amazon, for example, what a lot of people don't realize is, you know, 60% of Amazon's profits come from AWS. It doesn't even come from what we think about. You know, you the, their web service part of it, we don't even think about that. So it's a perfect example perfect of what you say. Example. We think about Amazon as like where we go to buy stuff. The 6% of their profits come from a service that a lot of people don't even realize that Amazon has. Yeah, that, that's such a good example. And then you have to believe in the future of that part of the business, whatever it is. Uh, so that that's, yes, that's my explanation of that one. Um, the other one is, now, this is a little more complicated. Try not to pay too much for the company stock. Well, how would you know what that was? I saw something yesterday. Um, it was in a more sophisticated piece of material. Uh, and I was glad that, that they were saying this because so many times these uh, sophisticated money managers are buying things without regard to its price. But I was interested in seeing that nowadays they are getting back to trying to match the price of the stock with the earnings of the company. So my explanation for something I call, or everybody calls, the peg ratio is in this book. And that gives you a very clear idea of where the price of a stock should be the price earnings ratio should be equal to the growth in earnings per share, percentage growth in earnings per share. Simple as that. Now, in the last few years, that's just been a rule that people have thrown out the window. And boy, those of us who didn't throw it out the window were very pleased when the market has fallen apart and our companies haven't fallen apart because we paid the right price. 
I love that. Yeah. And a lot of people don't even pay attention to earnings per share. Oh, I know. I know. I know. And how does, you know, you and I both know that that is the only reason other than euphoria and the kind of uh, uh, day trader who pushes the price of a stock up based on nothing other than rumor. You and I know that the underlying true quality and true uh, measure of a company's growth over time is if earnings are growing. Growth in earnings means growth in price of the stock. And that's that's what it'll all come down to when all this stuff, all this you know euphoria is over with. How does the- risk tolerance tie into all this? Because you know, I see so many people that that you know are too risk adverse to even get into investing, or other people that are too conservative, or other people that go all in and lose so much, right? I've I've known my share of people that think they can get into trade stocks, and they're like, yeah, this is it's like gambling. They're like, this is great, oh, no, and then trading, no, it's not uh, great anymore. That is definitely in the long run a loser's game. Truly, um, first of all, you just kill yourself, even if you're paying a penny in commission. Uh, you just, you can't time the market adequately. I don't know of anyone who can do that on a long-term basis. But aside from all that, that isn't investing. That is literally playing. And if you want to be an investor, which is the way to get rich, then you want to be in something that you believe in over the long-term because its earnings are growing and therefore its price of stock is going. Now, um, not wanting to get in because they're afraid, think back to ETF. Think back to what we talked about first. Getting in, okay, just a little bit at a time then maybe. Just start out with a few hundred dollars, something that maybe you would have tossed away on, I don't know, uh, you know, double Starbucks three times a day or something, I don't know, or a fancy lunch or something like that. Think about just trying it out. And actually, one of my best customers in the business was Richard Driehaus, called the father of momentum investing. And Richard, who sadly died this past year, uh, used to always say to me, volatility is our friend. That right now, (laughs) volatility is our friend. You've been looking, let's say you are investor A, who hasn't gotten into the market because your favorite company Price has been way too high because you were smart enough to know what was a good price. Well, volatility has knocked that good company down in the same fashion that the other bad companies have been knocked down. So it being your friend, buy into it now. Uh, So that is my answer to people who are afraid to get in. Now, those people who are you know, just going hog wild and buying everything and thinking they can trade and make money. Uh, Those, you know, those aren't my people. (laughs) I I, I have been in the business a long time and I can tell you that no one I know, and I know know many, many, many people in the business, no one I know believes that the market timer or the trader, day trader, will in the long run make money. That's interesting. So short-term, but not long-term. Uh, no, I'm saying long-term is the best investment. Short-term. But you mean they'll make, they'll make, they might make money short-term, but they're not making money. On yeah, yeah, long-term. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would venture to guess that that will not play out if they continue to do that. If they start short term and decide this is a pretty good thing, I'm going to stick with it and become long term. That's another matter. Here's something else. This is the last of my rules. And it says, don't expect your investments to spin straw into gold. Now, what that says is have realistic um, goals for your investing. In other words, Yeah, you may have heard that the market's been up 300%. Well, why isn't my stock up 300%? Oh, come on. (laughs) You know, that's uh, that's silly. Because if you are able to have your portfolio give you a real rate of 
return, meaning after inflation, after taxes, after everything, a real rate of return of 7% a year, year in and year out, you can't beat it. That's it. You're a rich person. And if you are lucky enough to get 10%, well, consider that an anomaly. It won't last all that long. On an average, even 5 to 7%. Real rate of return, that's after inflation, is a very, very good deal. And if that's what your goal is, you will then look at your stocks as to why you bought them. You bought certain stocks for income, utilities, REITs. Uh, you bought those for income and they pay income. And it usually grows that income in dividend payments year after year, if it's a really good company. But it's price, it, it, it's, its earnings aren't growing particularly. So it will be a more modest kind of a growth. If you buy a growth stock, because its earnings were growing, you're not going to look for a big dividend payment. That would be unrealistic. You bought it for growth, but know why you bought each thing you bought. I used to say to my classes, have at least five reasons why you bought this company. And if you often, you know, people ask, well, when do I sell a company? When do I sell a stock? Ideally never, but that's not realistic. You sell a stock when those original reasons that you bought it are no longer true. If you bought it because of great management and the management leaves, uh, you bought it because interest rates were going up or down or whatever, and that doesn't happen. All those things, those are the reasons you bought it. And if you look at the reasons you bought it and they're no longer valid, all right, it's not the stock you bought and meant to hold. So that's when you sell. What are some other tips to minimize the risk of investing? Well, to be more sophisticated uh, and not to get into too much detail, there are options strategies that mitigate risk, puts and calls. And I don't want to confuse people by going into the details, but I will say that both professional investors and people like me <laughs> use options strategies in order to you know, have a buffer on your uh, investment portfolio. Puts in times you think the stock market might go down, calls in times you think it might go up. But for further explanations of that, I would suggest that rather than try to get into a long uh, involved explanation now that people either Google it, they can find a very, very good explanation of both puts, calls, and options strategies for using those two uh, options on the internet. And those are, that's a way, that's a way to, the other, the other very good way, I think, is to have a very well diversified portfolio. And by that, I go into it briefly in my book, uh, the, what I call it the four season portfolio plan, because I, I equate it to the seasons of the year, uh, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And having something, am I going on too long, Ty? Oh, you're great. It just got me thinking about fall because it's my favorite season. Oh, I love fall. And you know, I love fall also as one of my investment portfolio pieces, because that's the one, you know, in fall, you don't quite know what the weather's going to be. You don't know whether it's going to be warm or, or cold or what. And so you want to be prepared for any one of those things, because it's kind of an indeterminate sort of uh, season. I like things like... Um, Convertible preferreds is getting into a little, uh, I don't want to confuse anybody, but convertible bonds, bonds at which you can convert into a stock, 
uh, convertible preferreds are the same thing. Real estate investment trusts, um, very, very good income from good quality REI. Those are REITs. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's what I like for a time when you really don't know. Interest rates going up, down, sideways, what do we know? Uh, this is almost kind of like a fall season, isn't it? It may look like winter, but it kind of looks like fall because it's very um, indeterminate, very um, volatile. Winter is when you know nothing good is happening. Maybe we're going into a winter, I don't know. Uh, but winter is when nothing's growing. Um, a company's earnings aren't growing. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's just a very depressed time in the stock market. And for that, you want to own bonds because bonds will pay you back, as I said, whatever you put into them, plus the interest until they mature. But you always want to own bonds of good quality. Those are the ones that will hold up. So that's winter. Uh, summer is great to have growth stocks in your portfolio to cover that season, because that's when everything in your garden is growing and your stocks earnings are growing as well. Spring, I like spring for emerging kinds of growth stocks. Companies who, who are, are not mature yet, they're not all grown up. And like spring in which things come shooting out of the ground during the day, uh, warm days, cool nights, like spring in the portfolio, having companies that are emerging or are mid cap companies that still have a ways to go and the environment, the economic environment is attractive for that kind of growth. You wanna participate in that. So if you have investments in your solid, your long-term portfolio to cover spring, emerging stocks, summer, growth stocks, fall, uh, convertibles, REITs, and winter, grade A, triple A, or double A bonds, you can almost sit back and say, no matter what happens, I'm taken care of. I, I have set myself up to take advantage of any good time and to be protected in any bad time. Susan, I've loved having you on. Where can we go to grab your book? Oh, <laughs> thanks for asking. Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. All have the book of that available. And I've so enjoyed, I've done all the talking, Ty. I, I've so enjoyed talking. <laughs> well, you know, even, even with you doing so, and, and this is why I've loved listening to you talk, because I've learned a lot. Um, and, you know, the other nice thing is that you've just shared so much information, but it's only just a smidgen of what's in your book. Like, there were still some rules that we missed. There was things that we didn't even talk about. You and just scratched depth, the surface. Really. But yeah. what I like about your book, what I love about your book is that it puts it in a format where it's it's story based. So it's just easy to digest. And the, the science of this is like 6% of facts we even retain, but like 100% of how we feel when we go through something we remember. And that's what your book does. It just makes you feel good. You're learning all these things in a story based format. Things that I felt were, were always complicated to understand really are simplified. So I mean, kudos, great I job of taking so much complex information and just putting it in a phenomenal story-based format that's really easily absorbable. I mean, this is why everybody should go grab your book. Thank you very much, Ty. I appreciate that. And I very much enjoyed being on your show. Yeah, and me, me too. I've loved having you on. So if you're watching this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put Susan's website on link on the show resources page, which is SusanLawbach.com. That's Susan, L-A-U-B-A-C-H.com. And I'm also going to put links to her book. And again, the book is Rumpelstiltskin's. Susan, can you hold up the book for me? Absolutely. It's Rumpelstiltskin's Rules for Making Your Farthings Grow. So take a screenshot of that real quick. 
If you can, it's Rumpelstiltskin's Rules for Making Your Farthings Grow. You've got to grab this book. I mean, look, there's a lot of us that should know this stuff, but we don't because it's complicated. We don't have time to learn it. Her book is super simple to read, easy to digest, and you're going to walk out with a lot of complex things that you didn't know before that you now can easily understand just by reading one book. And I love that. Okay, I read a whole book to get one concept. And her book is this concept after concept after concept that we've always been exposed to. And they're like, oh my gosh, I get it now. I completely understand because it's in such an easily digestible format. So make sure you grab it. It rumples stilt skins, rules for making your fatherings grow. You can get it on Kindle. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Audible. Um, so choose the best way that you want to listen or read. And also make sure you check out Susan's website as well. All of that will be on the show resources page. So thanks for tuning in. Make sure you grab Rumpelstiltskin's Rules for Making Your Fatherings Grow and have a great day.